Good evening. My name is Richard Hames. I am the chairman of the Centre for the Future. And in tonight's fireside chat, I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking with Dr. Shashi Tharoor, one of India's most notable intellectuals, uh, formerly an international diplomat who was um, Under Secretary General of the UN. He's a member of the parliament uh, today and the author of around 19 books, which beats me by 10 at the moment, although I believe he's working on another. it will beat me by 11. Uh, Shashi has had an incredibly vibrant and diverse career, uh, most notably from my point of view personally, as the author of a book called An Era of Darkness, which was about the British occupation of India, which uh, I read probably at least 10 years ago and was immensely uh, troubled uh, in a good way by, by, the, um, by the book. Uh, Shashi is also one of the most insightful and intelligent commentators on international affairs actually to be found in the world anywhere today. So Shashi, it's an absolute pleasure to be chatting with you this evening. Can I start by leaping straight in and asking you about the growing tensions between India and China on your shared border because it became much more than just sword rattling last week. Yes, Richard, it, it's actually, uh... It's a shared border, and yet it's not, because there is no agreed border. It's the world's longest undemarcated border, some 35,000 kilometers, I'm sorry, 3,500 kilometers uh, long, but which, um, which the two sides are simply not being able to agree to draw on a map. And we are now in a position where periodically there are flare-ups all the way from um, uh, the, the, the north, northern, northernmost part of India, state of Jammu and Kashmir, and now the Union Territory of Ladakh, all the way to the northeasternmost part of India, where China claims the state of Arunachal Pradesh that it describes as South Tibet. And with all of these troubles, um, India and China have surprisingly managed a modus of envy um, ever since 1975, which was the last time that anybody fired a shot in anger across that border. Mm. It had uh, different perceptions of the line of actual control, as it's called, the LAC, uh, but they've always managed to stop short of killing each other. That is, until the 15th of June, when there was a very nasty um, physical brawl uh, between two sets of soldiers, resulting in, in the deaths of 20 soldiers and the claimed deaths of some unknown number of Chinese as well. So it's been a, a particularly unpleasant um, uh, episode. Uh, it has involved a widespread perception in India that the Chinese have decided to proceed with their sort of salami slicing tactics of moving forward in disputed points of the LAT in order to consolidate what they would consider uh, a more defensible border for themselves before they ever agree to any serious talks with India on a final border settlement. And India is very much uh, caught on the defensive on this, on the back foot, as we say um, in, in the cricket playing world. Uh, and so um, we, we are looking at a fair amount of political tension domestically in India as well, as the public, the opposition, the media uh, have made this the major story of the week, which surprisingly enough, it is not in China. It's been downplayed significantly in China as a story. Now, this is where we stand. What are the long-term prospects? I don't think it's ever going to, going to get to a full-term war, a full-scale war, because neither side has any interest in that. But I think it may reproduce a pattern we have seen repeatedly with the Chinese, most recently on the Doklam Plateau, mm. where the Chinese will make a major encroachment, will then get into a standoff with the Indians. There will be talks. The Chinese will withdraw temporarily from one part of what they have taken. The Indians will be only too relieved and happy to declare victory and peace and, and head off back to, their, back to their own bunkers. And the Chinese will then consolidate their position in what remains. This keeps happening. And the result is a gradual redefinition of the LAC on Chinese terms, right all the way across uh, pretty much the entire span of it. And uh, the Chinese like to think long term. I think in decades' mm. time, they may say finally to some future Indian government, all right, now we'll talk about settling the border. 
and it'll have to be a border that recognizes where they physically are. And they yes. get there slowly. Yes. So, so the consensus, obviously, in India is that this is uh, coming from Beijing. It's not, it's not just local tensions boiling over on the border. It's, it's actually uh, quite um, politically tactical. Well, that's what many of us believe. I will, I will stress that it's very difficult to have a consensus on any of this because obviously mm. opinions are, are inflamed and polarized. And mm. there certainly will be some people, particularly those close to the government, who will say, don't make too much of this. It was probably just a local incident. Some chap on the ground didn't get right orders. I'm sure that Beijing loves us. The, the, the you know, Xi Jinping really gets along so well with Prime Minister Modi, etc., etc. So there will be some people who will take that line. Um, mm. Many of us in the opposition and I think large sections of the media and the commentariat are not so willing to give the government a pass on this. They do feel that we have uh, been caught napping by the Chinese and that this is a very deliberate tactical move based on a much larger strategic calculation in which, by the way, Indian feelings are seen as largely dispensable. I think mm. the Chinese always should have asked themselves, hey, if we do this, isn't there a risk that we're going to drive the Indians into Washington's embrace? Yes. And somebody yeah. in Beijing has thought about this and said, well, we doesn't matter enough. We don't really care. We're going to teach the Indians a lesson. This teaching the Indians a lesson is a phrase that goes back to 62. So I'm being a, a bit improper in reviving it now. But I yes. think that's the sort of thinking we've seen before. And I suspect it's a kind of thinking that's going on now. They don't so, really care at the end of the day if they lose it. So uh, is there an alternative way of dealing with this? What, what should the government be seeking to do um, in this situation? Well, I think for India, there are only two, uh, two uh, options that will really get consensus in the country. One is an absolute insistence on the restoration of the status quo ante. That is where everybody's positions were in April before the Chinese started encroaching, leading to the first clashes on the 5th of May. Uh, the second, that is the, so this is the immediate tactical uh, requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody in India is going to be willing to let the government back off. Uh, mm -hmm. But then the longer term objective for India ought to be to accelerate a settlement of the border. I don't think it makes any sense for India to be in a position where we have this long, undemarcated, unsettled border. And any time it suits Beijing, they can provoke an incident just to throw India off balance. Every time they feel India is distracted, here it was because of COVID, tomorrow it could be something else, and then the Chinese make their move, and as far as India is concerned, they're thrown off balance, they look weak, they look uncomfortable, they're on the defensive, they're anxious to settle it. Uh, this kind of thing is going on too often. There have been at least five significant incidents uh, in this 21st century alone, which is not, not a very long century so far. Mm -hmm. And so the worry that we see is, I'm afraid, um, uh, 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 of a certain incremental expansion by the Chinese, <laughs> which to my mind, India must resist by saying, in the short term, go back to where you were in April. In the long term, let's sit, sit down now and settle the border once and for all so these things don't keep happening. Uh, so, I mean, it's... Um a lot of people would make the comment that this is uh, this Chinese tactic is seen in elsewhere. I mean, in the South China Seas, for example. Um, uh, do you think, uh, in terms of what you're saying, do you think India and China are capable of resolving their differences without some kind of outside help? And where would that outside help come from? Well, India has historically had an allergy to outside inter interference, and China is not much different. I mean, I, mm. I can't, um, I think the last time China actually sought a mediator was during the time uh, in the early 50s when they shot down some American pilots in a U-2, and, mm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and of course, the U.S. didn't recognize Beijing and wouldn't negotiate with it, but wanted their pilots back. And uh, when China turned to Dag Hammarskjöld, the then U.N. Secretary General, he turned to the Indians, who yes. were the only ones of any consequence who had relations with both sides. And India went and negotiated the release of the Americans uh, from the Chinese. Uh, I'm not sure yet in return for what from the Americans, but that was the last 
re, uh, incident I can recall where the Chinese submitted to mediation. Otherwise, whether it was Korea, whether it was Vietnam, whether it was uh, any situation, including the war with India in 62, the mm. Chinese never allowed anybody else to come and work things out for them. And India has an allergy. It's partially because of, uh, well, partially, no, it's principally, I think, because of the colonial experience. When you've had a foreign country essentially make all the important decisions for you for 200 years, you pretty much decide to say, we never want any foreigner telling us at any point what we do. So, uh, yes. so India has never accepted mediation. It yes. has accepted arbitration through the International Court of Justice, through the Law of the Sea Tribunal, and so on. There has been a responsible international citizen. But on politics uh, and geopolitics, uh, it tends to say we can settle our differences whether it's with Pakistan, whether it's with Bangladesh, whether it's with uh, China, whether it's with Nepal, we can settle them bilaterally. That's the Indian attitude. So mm -hmm. I don't think this is going to be uh, easily, easily resolved through that method, though I would personally be of the view that it's going to be very difficult for a long time now for the two sides to sit down together because the maximalist demands of both sides are mutually irreconcilable. The Chinese have a crucial highway that connects uh, uh, Xinjiang, the Uyghur Autonomous Region, as they call it, to Tibet. And that runs through territory that India claims in Aksai Chin, in northeastern Ladakh. Um, and, and that's clearly something that China will never surrender. They control it, and they're not going to give it up, even if some mediator says that all the maps favor the Indian claim, the Chinese will never agree. Mm -hmm. Similarly... India is never going to surrender a populated state of Arunachal Pradesh full of Indian citizens uh, because China wants to lay claim to what they call South Tibet. And China, of course, has a very important reason for not relinquishing that claim, which is what happens when the Dalai Lama moves on to another world. Yeah. They, are, they are anxious to do what they did with the Panchen Lama, which is to actually... Uh, find a little kid somewhere in Chinese uh, Tibet, uh, identify him as the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama, park him uh, under close arrest in Beijing for 16 or 18 years, indoctrinate him thoroughly, and then release him to the world as a new Dalai Lama. Problem solved. Uh, uh, but um, obviously the Tibetan diaspora isn't going to st stick for that, and they're likely to find a Dalai Lama from the diaspora. If they try and do that in, in places of Tibetan settlements like Mysore or Los Angeles or even Dharamsala, I think the Chinese can say, well, what's the credibility of that? Mm -hmm. But if, for example, a little Dalai Lama is found in Tawang, which happens to not just be in India, but be the actual birthplace of the sixth Dalai Lama a couple of centuries ago, mm -hmm. then the credibility of that Dalai Lama would be far greater than a captive Dalai Lama of the Chinese. And this is why I believe the Chinese are determined sooner rather than later uh, to wrest control of the Wang and to say that the Wang belongs to Chinese Tibet uh, in order to prevent the Tibetan diaspora from doing this with the uh, uh, deliberate connivance or simply the, the, uh, the inattention or the, or shall we say, the, uh, the silence of the Indian authorities. Now, all of this kind of calculation uh, may well lie behind the Chinese position uh, on the Northeast. But can you imagine sitting across the table and trying to reconcile these concerns? It's impossible. India yes. cannot give up a territory full of Indian citizens, and China cannot afford to give up its claim to it. On the other side of Aksai Chin, there are hardly any citizens there, and China controls the territory anyway. But India would want something in return for relinquishing a rather large chunk of its map. Uh, because India still on paper claims that territory that it hasn't controlled since 1959. That's yes. where we stand. Yes. And I think, I think it, it looks like one of these really long-lasting and fairly intractable problems for the future. But you're the expert in the future, Richard. Have you thought about this? <laughs> yes, I have. And, but before we get to that, uh, I, I'd like to move to a more philosophical level, if you like, uh, and also relate it to... This, this pandemic that uh, we're all in at the moment, uh, it's, it's opened up fault lines in our civilization. 
in dealing with issues that are facing the entire human family, like climate change, for, for example. Uh, specifically, we're waking up, I think, to the toxicity of competition, the problem associated with relentless economic growth, issues arising from the exercise of power, which we've just been talking about by nation states, which, after all, in the context of market capitalism, uh, the nation was set up to compete with each other rather than to cooperate. So at, at that level, it does make things rather tr tricky. Uh, Shashish, what does India need to be able to do to take a leading role in the establishment of a new collaborative community of nations to solve these kinds of problems? Or is it too embedded? Is India too embedded like every other sovereign state at the moment? in the orthodox notions of what sovereignty actually means? Well, India has, has some interest in preserving those orthodox notions, Richard. In other words, uh, India has reacted with alarm, for example, to the American decision to pull out of WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, mm. because India does believe these multilateral institutions so painstakingly built up after the Second World War are actually are beneficial for all of humanity and particularly for the developing world, which is able to leverage a certain amount of, uh, of, of, of support, assistance, expertise, knowledge, and so on from the world community uh, to benefit the poorer countries. And so India, I think, would want to see multilateralism preserved. It can be reformed and reinvented, but it can't be reinvented from scratch. Uh, I know there are some people that say the UN really reflects the geopolitical realities of 1945. It's a different world now. Let's crap it and start again. The problem is I don't know that we have statesmen in the world with the imagination and the vision to actually start again. And if we scrap what we've got, we may end up with nothing. And that's why I believe mm. it's better to take what we've got and try and reform it. So, for example, the COVID disaster uh, has led to some very fundamental questioning. Why was this allowed to happen? What's the point of a World Health Organization if the world wasn't forewarned in advance and China got a free pass? Well, why did China get a free pass? Because the big countries in the world have set these organizations up to reflect their power and control mm -hmm. and have made it impossible for these organizations to function totally autonomously of the powers, uh, the big powers in the world. So if we can rewrite the rules, if, for example, it's true, as I believe it is, I've been told by reliable sources, that in the first week of January, the WHO wanted to send a bunch of experts, independent experts, to Wuhan to see for themselves about what this virus was, and China wouldn't give them any visa, so they couldn't go. Maybe we need to write the rule that these organizations will have enough autonomy to be able to tell any country, we're coming, and you really have to lump it. Uh, yes. Maybe we can rewrite the rules to insist that the executive heads of these organizations have one single non-renewable term, not just of four or five years, but maybe of six or seven years. Yes. So they're not constantly looking over their shoulders of the big powers who can veto their re-election or enable their re-election. It becomes an unspoken factor in the quiescence of many of these agencies' administrative heads. These are just examples of the kinds of things we can do. But certainly, I would like to see India remain a voice for multilateralism. I would like to see India continue to speak up for global cooperation, because I believe that was one of the great accomplishments of the end of the Second World War. And I hope we don't have to collapse into a third to realize that we actually are in a good thing that we shouldn't destroy. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you've been very vocal uh, about that. How, if you'd still been at the UN, and I, I'm sorry you're not, but um, if you were, what, what kind of steps would you take now, given the, the situation globally in terms of geopolitics and the dynamics around all of that at the moment, including the, the re-emergence, not the rise, but the re-emergence of China, the standoff with the US and the, 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 almost tragic situation that's occurring in the U.S. in terms of what looks like a, an implosion of um, fundamentals from the founding fathers. What would you, what would you do? What, how would you go about reforming the U.N. to have teeth so that, that, that these questions were resolved amicably and easily? Well, the truth is, Richard, only governments can reform it. Uh, an enlightened a UN secretary, an official or a secretary general can't because ultimately 
uh, the power lies with member states. The UN is both a stage and an actor. It's a stage on which member states are playing their parts. It's an actor executing the script the member states write for it. So I think we have to understand the great importance of getting countries together to decide what's the right way forward. My own instinct, if I were an international official there today, would be to try and get the Americans back on board. I think we're in a very dangerous uh, situation right now with the U.S. pullout of WHO um, uh, and UNESCO. That's two agencies they've left. There may be more to follow. I think it's important we try and get uh, a very quick consensus, try and stir up, for example, the allies of the U.S. to talk to them about why this is wrong, why this is unwise, try and get them together. This should have been done ideally during the so-called 30-day notice period the, that Washington had issued. Then I think we should also try and work towards a post-U.S. election summit, um, ideally not at the Security Council level, but at the General Assembly level, mm -hmm. to get all the world leaders together to talk about uh, how the world moves forward post-COVID. Uh, I say post-U.S. election for two reasons. Number one, we don't know whether Mr. Trump, with his isolationism and xenophobia, his America first philosophy is going to be around for another four years or whether we're going to have a different sort of America. But uh, that would certainly influence, because they are the most uh, significant players in all this. That would influence the timing. But secondly, of course, we hope that we would know whether we, are, we have overcome COVID by then or if not, whether we have to wait to see the winter out. But thereafter, we need to really have a global summit on reinventing multilateralism. Don't forget it's affecting everything, the economy. Yes. Yes. The deglobalization we are seeing more and more, uh, the, um, the demultilateralism, the increasing decoupling from foreign supply chains and production chains, the, the emphasis on bringing manufacturing back into, into individual countries. We may be reversing everything that we have taken for granted for the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the, what the most important thing that the international system can do is to make one last serious desperate attempt to save itself and to save global cooperation. It's, it's, I, I don't disagree with you. What alarms me about uh, that kind of summit is the resorting to a traditional toolkit of how dialogue happens. Uh, so in my experience, I can, I can only begin to grasp the complexity of the patterns that I see in any situation where I can visualize those patterns. Uh, so, how can we uh, how can we uh, persuade uh, the those organizations to adopt different toolkits so that they can actually go beyond the threshold we see at the cognitive threshold we seem to have reached where these problems we we don't the global problems we don't seem to be able to solve in as, as you said it's a crisis of imagination but it's also a crisis of, of cognition. It is. Um, if I can be somebody who operates or has operated in the real world internationally and now operates in the real world politically, it's also it's both of those things, but it's also a crisis of practice and process. I'll give you one example. Yes. One of the big multilateral institutions is the World Trade Organization, right? Mm. The World Trade Organization is significant because it actually is one of the very few uh, international organizations that has a solid enforcement mechanism. If I represent a country and you represent a country and I go and complain about you to the established authorities of the WTO, they can actually hear both sides, make a ruling, and it's binding on us. So what has the U.S. gone and done? It's essentially failed to renew the appointments of any of the people on the tribunal that will actually do the dispute settlement. And the net result is that group no longer has a quorum and can no longer rule. So you and I can complain till we're blue in the face but there is no one with the authority of the numbers to, do, to, to make a decision. So multilateralism can be undermined, not just by pulling out of an organization, but by these process issues, by preventing individuals from being reappointed, by delaying <coughs> structural matters, and so on. So, so my, my answer to you, Richard, would be there are issues of cognition, there are certainly issues of imagination, and there are issues of process. And that's why I'd like to see countries come together in a very serious summit saying, how do we reinvent, reaffirm multilateralism so that it works better for the world? And how do we make that more likely than not, that coming together? At the moment, I think uh, 
it's not looking good. First of all, one of the things that COVID has done is made everybody focus on themselves. We have to save ourselves, save our people, save our own country. Uh, they're all saying, listen, let's let's uh, make sure that that remains our, our, total, uh, our total priority. Um, everyone's also worried about their economic problems, their unemployment problems, their collapsing growth, their mortality rates. It, it's understandable. But equally, they also feel that they have learned from this, uh, from this experience, that actually there are a number of things. Uh, the pandemic for them uh, shows that people are relying on their governments to shield them. That global supply chains are vulnerable to disruption and are therefore unsustainable. That dependence on foreign countries for essential goods, such as pharmaceuticals, even the ingredients that go into making them, could be fatal. Uh, you remember nations tried aggressively to acquire medicines and supplies for their own people at the expense of each other. There's now a rush to reset global supply chains, to raise trade barriers. There's a demand for more protectionism, for more self-reliance, a phrase our India Prime Minister used, for bringing manufacturing and production value chains back home, or at least closer to home. Uh, even international travel across free and open borders has been interrupted by COVID, and it may remain vulnerable in the post-COVID era. Uh, why shouldn't global flow of capital investments also be vulnerable? Why shouldn't multi-border pipelines or energy grids be vulnerable? You know, you're looking at a situation where everything we've taken for granted is up for grabs. World goods trade, I think the estimates I've read, may shrink by 30% this year, if not more. Um, you've got all sorts of... Um, all sorts of concerns happening. Um, COVID has convinced many that foreigners are to be feared, that strict border and immigration controls are essential, that countries can't always expect useful help from their neighbors and allies, that national interests should always trump international cooperation. And so many countries, and I'm afraid India's Mr. Modi may be no different, are saying the answer lies in strong government. Let's put our nation's needs over individual citizens' freedoms. Let's dispense with democratic niceties, whether it's federalism in a country like India or parliamentary oversight in a country like Hungary. So many governments are saying, let's take more power to ourselves, because that's the only way in which we can deal with it. And then you've got xenophobia as well mounting. I don't know if you are a WhatsApp user, but there are WhatsApp videos going around of people who look Chinese being thrown out of supermarkets in Western countries. Oh, yes, uh, yeah. Northeastern citizens who happen to look a little more uh, uh, East Asian uh, than South Asian, have encountered racial incidents in India. And these are Indian citizens. Uh, we've had a huge row about a Muslim sect in India that actually held a, a gathering. Uh, many of whose members who come from abroad had, had been infected and spread the infection throughout the country. And suddenly a huge amount of Islamophobia started as a result. So you're looking at a situation, Richard, where... Every negative trend that could emerge from people's trying to adjust to the horrific shock of COVID, every negative trend has been visible. And to pull back, we need to actually take stock to say these are the things we've seen countries wrongly, wrongly um, learning. Here's what we would like to ourselves address. And, uh, and by the way, uh, we believe that what was achieved in 1945 may not be perfect, but it's a darn sight better than what happened in the world before 45, when you had two world wars, countless civil wars, mass displacement of peoples, and the horrors of the Holocaust and Hiroshima. I think given that, we're far better off with a flawed international system than none at all. So, so I, I tend to agree with you, uh, but we're also facing... Uh, a series of emergencies that are going to be even worse than we've got at the moment. If you like, this is a dress rehearsal for the kinds of uh, crises that we're going to be facing within the decade, probably with something like climate change, more pandemics. Uh, how will, how can we be sure that the geopolitical situation will not worsen those kinds of situations? How can we be sure that the uh, potential for a nuclear accident, for example, will be attenuated rather than uh, amplified by the kinds of emergencies we're going to have to deal with? Well, I mean, I'd say that there's absolutely nothing we can take for granted. And certainly I, I do think that, uh, that things can get worse, but uh, there's no specific reason to say, for example, that we are likely to have a nuclear flashpoint that we didn't have uh, earlier. Uh, because ultimately, um, 
the international mechanisms are fortunately still in place. And even if, say, Mr. Trump pulls out a WHO, he's not rushing to pull out of the IAEA. Even if he welches on the agreement with Iran, he's not doing anything um, that would actually, um, shall we say, provoke uh, a nuclear flashpoint with Iran and so on and so forth. Even India and China, both nuclear powers, India and Pakistan are both nuclear powers. But neither has really ever come to the brink of getting to that sort of situation. So barring an accident, um, and an accident, uh, I don't mean of people deliberately doing something to each other, but literally a, a meltdown in the nuclear reactor, something like that. I don't see the nuclear threat that everyone spent decades worrying about as the biggest threat facing the world today. Uh, I'm much more concerned, Richard, about the risk of a foundering of the foundations that have been built up since 1945, that for 75 years have given us a world order <clears throat> that for all its flaws, and I can anatomize many of the flaws. I've written a book, by the way, uh, my 20th, I'm sorry to break it. <laughs> with Samir Staran, called The New World Disorder, in which we've, we've really ruthlessly critiqued the flaws of the international system. But yes. the truth is that the, um, the, uh, the system, however flawed it is, is so much better than the alternative that it makes sense that we all stay committed and try to work it out. What we need is a marriage counselor, not a divorce. <laughs> so let, let's look at one of the problems that we're trying to deal with at the moment. And that's the, it, it's almost paranoia among some people regarding the reemergence or the rise of China within the context of our region. How should we be dealing with that? China and the context of the overall region is worrying me. Uh, you were right. You mentioned earlier, Richard, the number of incidents beyond India. We've seen uh, a very <coughs> nice incident with Taiwan. We've seen uh, the, the Chinese encroachment on the Senkaku Islands with Japan. We've seen um, Hong Kong, the new security law. There have been a couple of flashpoints in the Spratlys with Malaysia and Indonesia, and Malaysia and the Philippines, I beg your pardon. Um, and there was an, in, uh, an incident involving a, a, a ship, was it? A, I've forgotten whose country ship it was. A Vietnamese ship that the yes. Chinese uh, intimidated and buzzed with, with one of their bigger, more powerful vessels. All of this has happened in the last five or six weeks. So you're, you're talking about a very assertive China that's busy flexing its muscles. And I think it's, it's partially that China feels um, irritated and hurt that uh, while they were laid low by COVID, the world took advantage, pointed fingers at them, blamed them for spreading this virus and all of that stuff. And therefore, China says, well, we're going to show you, uh, you, you can't take us lightly. We are big, we are strong, we are rich, and, and we will push our, push our way around and remind you of that. That seems to be the, 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 the only plausible explanation for this pattern of incidents. Um, I think we are dealing with a power that then genuinely sees itself destined to being the world's most significant superpower by the middle of the century. It is well on the way there. It went through uh, three or four decades of a peaceful rise. I think now it doesn't feel <coughs> that obliged um, to worry about the peaceful part of the rise. I think the rise is now more important than the peace. And the Chinese are prepared to pay a small price. As I said earlier, when we talked about the India-China border incident, I think they've really thought it through and they've said, yeah, so, OK, we might push the Indians into the arms of the Americans. Um, that's a risk we're prepared to take because we can do without them. Um, I actually think that within India, there'd be a strong constituency not to fall into the arms of the Americans because India is mm. also very proud of its strategic autonomy, very anxious to remain independent. Um, and, and, and they would feel in some ways diminished uh, in New Delhi if they went off and signed up with, with uh, uh, a more closer partnership. They'll never call it an alliance, but a more closer partnership with the Western countries and particularly with Washington uh, against China for the simple reason that that's not been India's way. India's always said, we are stubbornly proud of our independence. We'll make our own decisions. We don't wag anybody. We're not the tail wagging, wagged by any other dog. You know, that sort of feeling. So... Um, China has probably calculated that risk and said, no, the bottom line, it's a risk worth taking. We might lose India, but the preponderance is India for its own reasons won't go off. And in any case, China is not the kind of country like a democracy where you'll have breast beating commentators writing, who lost India? You know, never going to happen. Yeah. So the Chinese, I think, have decided that they're going to flex their muscles and the rest of the world can lump it. And I think the rest of the world has to do some serious introspection. 
asking themselves, can we lump it? And if not, what are we going to do about it? What are the mechanisms in our, in our, in our capacity that can persuade the Chinese that they are better off playing along with the rest of us? I mean, in East Asia, you've got the RCEP, the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which India chose not to join. And I, I personally regretted that at the time. Now, with the Chinese aggression, I think it would be a much harder sell in India than it was at that time. It was hard enough then for economic reasons. Now, there'll also be geopolitics because people are going to say, in India, uh, if we join RCEP, we're simply just going to be uh, opening our markets to the Chinese. Uh, why should we actually uh, do that? And so for this reason, um, uh, I would look at the rest of you, and by the rest of you, I mean all the ASEAN countries, Australia, New Zealand, uh, all of you, and the Chinese and the Koreans and the Japanese, are uh, looking at RCEP as a way not just of giving the Chinese an even larger market, which is what Indians uh, think is going to happen, but also of keeping the Chinese within the bounds of a sensible relationship and keep them committed to being involved with us, involved with the, uh, with the uh, um, shall we say, with the rest of the world, though in this case it's the rest of Asia, really, um, in a common set of arrangements of mutual benefit that they would not want to harm. Now, I don't know if, if uh, the current trade war between China and Australia is compatible with RCEP. It probably isn't. Um, I don't know how the efforts of countries like Australia and New Zealand to persuade India uh, to rethink its, its negativism and come back to RCEP, how far that's going to go. So there are lots of unknown questions there too, mm. Richard. That's mm. one part of the answer to your question. Thank you. Uh, let's... Uh because this is Harassis India, let's shine the light back on India. Shashi, we have both suffered from highly charged criticism in the past when our interpretation of events goes against the official narrative. Uh, from your perspective, what is India's future role in terms of healing geopolitical rifts that emanate from the deep past yet still continue to resonate today? India's role in healing deep <laughs> geopolitical rifts. Well, look, we, we've got our share of troubles around our border right now. Mm. We have a geopolitical rift and, and worse with Pakistan, which is a, a consequence of the 200 years or 100 years of British policy of divide and rule uh, that partitioned the subcontinent and created a, a permanent hostility uh, on our borders. We have a serious problem with China, as I mentioned earlier, about the undemarcated border. We have um, the Chinese desperately wooing uh, other countries in our periphery. For example, the Nepalese Communist Party, which was a bunch of splinter factions that the Chinese brought together into one, is now ruling Nepal and has turned quite hostile to India. Uh, we also have, uh, in addition to Pakistan, China and Nepal, we have potential issues. Uh, with the other neighbors around us as well, uh, many of whom, of course, have a very significant economically dependent relationship on China. So those are the geopolitics we'll be living with. Um, I think that uh, paradoxically, a region from which we had kept aloof for a while, uh, for the first 50 years after the Second World War, namely uh, Southeast Asia, has now become much closer to us because we don't really have any areas of geopolitical tension with the ASEAN countries. We have very good relations mm -hmm. with a whole lot of them. Singapore, Myanmar, Laos, Vietnam, you name it, Thailand, of course, where you are. India has very good bilateral relations and very good collective relations with the whole lot. And so in some ways, it's, it's where the geopolitics hasn't come in and sucked us in the nose in our own immediate neighborhood that we actually have uh, a better relationship and, and, and an easier way forward. It didn't work for RCEP, but it could work in, in geopolitics. And as far as our subcontinent is concerned, we're going to have to really get our act together. I think India has to follow a policy that I advocated many years ago when I was in government and out of government of asymmetrical relationships uh, with our neighbors. Uh, all small countries have a chronic problem with big country neighbors. I always remind Americans of the great mm. Mexican leader Porfirio Diaz's famous line, oh, my poor country is so far from God and so close to the United States. I mean, there must be equivalent to that. <laughs> yes. every, country, every small country speaking about big ones, and we've got a lot of small countries around us. If the countries of South Asia sit around the table, India accounts 
for 70% of the population and 80% of the GDP. So obviously the South Asian countries will have a complex about us. The only way we can deal with that is to give more than we take and to see our own interests tied up in creating a better relationship with the countries in our neighborhood. I believe we're capable of that. Whether we'll do it, of course, depends very much on the government of the day. And as an opposition MP, let me say, I don't have a heck of a lot of faith uh, that my president <laughs> is necessarily going to do what I think they should be doing. Uh, I, I must admit, I have uh, little faith in incumbent politicians anywhere in the world at the moment. So uh, no, I'm, I'm afraid I'm biased. <laughs> one, one final question. Uh, in, we're talking about geopolit uh, geopolitics in terms of the the global community because we very much are a connected human family now and it's become very obvious in terms of COVID-19 how interconnected we are, how reliant we are on each other. What do you think is the single most important factor going forward to ensure peace? Oh, I think, I think the only important factor that's always ensured peace has been a recognition and a perception on the part of countries that peace was more in their interest than the alternative. Wherever countries felt they could pursue their own interest, their own advantage in a way that actually um, didn't jeopardize peace, they would do it. But they would think twice about going in for war. In fact, one of the things we saw during the Cold War was how the big powers outsourced war. America and Russia never went to war. But my gosh, they supported proxies halfway around the world. The periphery was constantly mm. at uh, mm. Whether you call it liberation movements on the one hand, whether you call it coups on the other, there were yes. conflict, wars and deaths around the periphery. But the heart of the world, the US, the Soviet Union, NATO, the Warsaw Pact, all of Europe, etc., stayed at peace. And that in many ways is a suggestion that when big countries feel they can't afford war, uh, they will try to avoid it. Um, and they may let others do it for, for their own advantage, but they won't do it themselves. Today, we are, I believe, in the danger of heading towards a new Cold War between the U.S. and China. All the signs point in that direction. There may be a break applied to that if Mr. Trump loses in November. I think the way things are going, uh, things are very unpredictable. No one ever thought of the U.S., as a source of geopolitical instability, but it does seem to be that today. And in these circumstances, Richard, I would say that what we have to watch out for in the next two or three years, how will the U.S. Um, behave after the election of 2020? How will the Chinese try and come to an accommodation with Washington or will they not? How will the inevitable rise of China and the possible eclipse of the U.S. play out in the hearts of other countries? And finally, mm -hmm. how will the rest of us have to adjust to superpower competition between the two? Will we have to choose? Will there have to be a new non-alignment like what Nehru, Nasser and Nkrumah came up with in the late 50s um, between these powers? Or will we all be choosing sides in a dystopian Orwellian 1984 kind of world? It's a worrying prospect. I don't think there are very clear answers just yet. But it's an interesting, exciting and worrying time to be looking at all these questions in the years ahead. And what a wonderful way to end this conversation. I'm so delighted that uh, we've had this conversation. I think we've ranged over a number of issues. I just want to thank you so much for your time and uh, for your input, Shashi. It's been wonderful. Thanks so much, Richard. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, I look forward to knowing more about your views of the future. Until we have a few seconds left, why don't you give me uh, one view of whether you, you would see the world in a little more optimistic light than I just mentioned. I think optim my optimism is with young people. Uh, I think the people of my generation and certainly older need to get out of the way and leave young people to have more of a voice in. We're, we're dealing with their future. And uh, sometimes I don't think my generation realizes that to a great extent, we've caused a lot of these problems but we still think we have a lot of the solutions. And I'm not so sure that's right. Fair enough. Well, let's count on the next generation. Thank you very much, Richard. Absolutely. Enjoy Thank you, Shashi. Good night. Everyone who tuned in. Take care. Take care.